Heathcliff's relationship to Cathy in Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. There's a lot going on in Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. And there's one aspect of it in particular that I think deserves more of an airing than it generally gets, and that's an aspect of the relationship between Catherine and Heathcliff. Are they possibly related by blood? Perhaps for many people, the 1939 movie starring Merle Oberon and Laurence Olivier has become the iconic depiction of Wuthering Heights. Seen through the filter of the movie, Bronte's novel is a roman noir, a tale of star-crossed lovers tragically separated by death. The novel itself is rather different. When Heathcliff comes back after his mysterious disappearance, Catherine tells Isabella Linton, who has developed a crush on him, that he's a fierce, pitiless, wolfish man quite unlike the rough diamond he's made out to be in the movie. Among other gratuitous acts of cruelty in the book, Heathcliff hangs Isabella's pet dog, Fanny, from a bridle hook and leaves it to die, although Nellie rescues it. John Sutherland even speculates that he may have murdered Hindley. And Catherine herself is no angel. Nellie talks of Catherine's senseless, wicked rages when her husband, not unreasonably, refuses to accept her relationship with Heathcliff after his return, and, as John Hagen puts it, she becomes increasingly malignant and perverse, and the vital and vivacious Catherine of childhood is transformed into a histrionic, vindictive harridan, an egomaniac and a paranoiac on the verge of insanity. I sometimes wonder if anything about Wuthering Heights is as it appears. Nellie Dean, as the main narrator, places herself in the best light, but as James Halfley points out, she does nothing to prevent Hendley from bullying Heathcliff as a child. It's her failure to tell Cathy that Heathcliff is listening, which is as it would degrade her to marry him, that leads Heathcliff to run away. And on her deathbed, Cathy says, Nellie has played traitor. Nellie is my hidden enemy. Even Nellie herself says at one point, I thought Heathcliff himself less guilty than I. And her manipulation of the protagonists leaves her effectively in control of both Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange. Is she a malicious plotter all the way through? As Gideon Shunami notes, neither Nellie nor Lockwood is a reliable narrator, which puts the reader in the position of constantly having to work out not what is said, but what is meant by what is said. And there's nowhere in the novel where this applies more aptly than in the passage where Nellie, at the beginning of her narrative, describes Mr Earnshaw's trip to Liverpool. Here's the gist of it. One fine summer morning, it was the beginning of harvest, Mr Earnshaw came downstairs dressed for a journey. And after he had told Joseph what was to be done during the day, he said, speaking to his son, now, my bonny man, I'm going to Liverpool today. What shall I bring you? I shall walk there and back, sixty miles each way. That is a long spell. Hindley named a fiddle. And then he asked Miss Caffey, who was hardly six years old, and she chose a riding whip. He promised to bring me, Nellie says, a pocket full of apples and pears. And then he set off. It seemed a long while to us all, the three days of his absence. Mrs Earnshaw expected him by supper time on the third evening, and she put the meal off hour after hour. Then it grew dark, and just about eleven o'clock the door latch was raised quietly, and in stepped the master. 
he threw himself into a chair, laughing and groaning, and bid them all stand off, for he was nearly killed. He would not have such another walk for the three kingdoms. And at the end of it, to be flighted to death, he said, opening his great coat, which he held bundled up in his arms. See here, wife, I was never so beaten with anything in my life. But you must e'en take it as a gift of God, though it's as dark almost as if it came from the devil. We crowded round, and over Miss Cathy's head I had a peep at a dirty, ragged, black-haired child, big enough both to walk and talk. Yet, when it was set on its feet, it only stared round and repeated over and over again some gibberish that nobody could understand. I was frightened. And Mrs. Earnshaw was ready to fling it out of doors. She did fly up, asking how he could fashion to bring that gypsy brat into the house when they had their own bairns to feed and fend for. What he meant to do with it, and whether he were mad. The master tried to explain, but all that I could make out was a tale of his seeing it starving and houseless and as good as dumb in the streets of Liverpool, where he picked it up and inquired for its owner. Not a soul knew to whom it belonged, he said, and he thought it better to take it home with him at once than run into vain expenses there, because he was determined he would not leave it as he found it. We also learn that as a result of Mr Earnshaw's efforts to care for the child he has found, the fiddle is broken and the whip is lost the first sign that he prioritises the waif Heathcliff over his legitimate children. There are several aspects of Nelly's account that are worth noting. The first and most obvious one is the distance. Walking 60 miles to Liverpool and then back again within three days is virtually impossible. A trained walker might cover 30 or even 35 miles a day over flat terrain, but there's a lot of hilly countryside between Wuthering Heights and Liverpool. We do not know the nature of Mr Earnshaw's business in Liverpool, but the idea that he walked to Liverpool, did whatever business it was he went there for, rescued a child from the streets and returned to Wuthering Heights all in the space of three days is basically beyond belief. And it's not just Earnshaw. Somehow, the starving Heathcliff also covered 60 miles. We know that Cathy is six years old at this time, and 30 years later on meeting Heathcliff, Lockwood estimates that he's about 40. So when he first arrives at Wuthering Heights, Heathcliff is at least a year or two older than she is. Too young and apparently undernourished to walk such a distance, but also too old to be carried all that way. Emily Bronte would surely have known how unfeasible Earnshaw's account is. She apparently never went to Liverpool, but she worked in Halifax, some ten miles away from where we may suppose Wuthering Heights was situated, and travelled to York, about forty miles away, so she would have known the distances involved and the time it would take to cover them. According to her sister Charlotte, she rarely went out except to go to church or take a walk on the hills. Further evidence that she would have had a good sense of walking times and distances in the area. She also has Nellie say that Earnshaw tried to explain how he had come across Heathcliff, how he told a tale of finding him starving on the streets of Liverpool. Adding it all up, it seems like a fairly broad hint that Earnshaw went not to Liverpool, but somewhere closer at hand. Additional details supporting this interpretation can be found in the text. Earnshaw leaves the farm at the beginning of harvest, a time when, as the master, he's most likely to be needed. He doesn't state his business in Liverpool, uh, nor gives the reason for walking rather than taking a carriage, and he wears a, a great coat, despite the fact that it's summer. Earnshaw even gives Heathcliff the name of a son who died in childhood. Looking 
outside the pages of the novel, we can also find support for the idea that Heathcliff may be Earnshaw's illegitimate child. Poverty was widespread, and there would have been quite a number of beggars, vagabonds and homeless people on the streets of Liverpool at that time. Why would Earnshaw have taken it into his head to rescue Heathcliff in particular? If Heathcliff really is, as Mrs Earnshaw calls him, a gypsy, i.e. a Romany, then he would probably have been living a nomadic life. Romanies would typically follow the harvest in a fairly regular yearly pattern. So Earnshaw may have known that this particular time was a window of opportunity for him to find the child and take him into his care. Rightly or not, Romany women had been accused of prostitution since at least 1568, when one Thomas Smith denounced that mob of rascals, prostitutes and thieves whom they called gypsies. And if Heathcliff was raised among Romany people, who at that time still mainly used their own language, that would explain his gibberish. We should also note that at that time some kind of cover story, such as finding a child destitute on the streets and taking pity, was a not uncommon subterfuge for bringing an illegitimate child into the family. Adele Varenz in Emily Bronte's sister Charlotte's Jane Eyre is a case in point. At first she's presented as a ward taken in by Rochester out of charitable kindness, but later is revealed to be his illegitimate daughter. But if Emily Bronte wanted readers to understand that Heathcliff was Earnshaw's child, why didn't she, at some stage, reveal that in the narrative, as her sister did in Jane Eyre? The likely answer to that is that, while the scandal of an illegitimate child could be discussed in the literature of the time, incest was far more taboo. The bond between Cathy and Heathcliff is central to the novel and in order not to cross a line in an already controversial and risky piece of work, Bronte merely hints at the possibility that they are siblings, rather than explicitly saying so. Because of the taboo nature of incest, we can never state with certainty whether Bronte intended her readers to read between the lines or whether she expected them to take the explanation of Heathcliff's origins at face value. But the unusually strong bond that sometimes develops in later life between siblings separated at birth is well documented, and it's at least possible that Bronte somehow knew this, and that this is what lies at the heart of Cathy's famous declaration, I am Heathcliff and, after Cathy's death, Heathcliff's assertion that I cannot live without my life, I cannot live without my soul. Ironically, in an attempt to make life imitate art, the idea that Emily Bronte had a thing for her brother Branwell started to gain traction after her death, beginning with a biography of Emily published in 1883, and building to a head with several works of fiction published in the 1930s, speculating on some kind of incestuous relationship. That's been explored in detail by Amber Bullio, and if you're interested in following it up, the link should be appearing above my head round about now. The bottom line, though, is that there's no reason to suspect that there was anything unusual about Emily's relationship with her brother. Wuthering Heights is essentially an extraordinary and multi-layered work of fiction, and whatever we make of Cathy and Heathcliff's relationship, the power of the characters and of the narrative make it one of the absolute must-reads of English literature.